morning or good afternoon, depends on your uh, location today. My name is Khalil Jashan, and I'm executive director uh, of Arab Center, uh, Washington, DC. Welcome to this uh, special event, uh, jointly organized by uh, the uh, uh, Institute for Palestine Studies and Arab Center, uh, Washington, DC, focusing on uh, challenges uh, of holding uh, Palestinian uh, elections uh, under uh, occupation. Uh, as you all know, uh, on January 15, 2021, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, president of the Palestinian Authority, issued a decree calling for uh, legislative, presidential, and PLO National Council elections before the end of the year. Uh, the move, uh, of course, uh, raised uh, all kinds of skepticism, many questions, both at home and abroad, uh, about uh, the motives, the capacity, the real intentions uh, behind this decree to actually implement uh, this executive order, particularly since no presidential elections have been held in Palestine uh, since 2005-2006. Uh, the presidential directive specified that parliamentary elections uh, for a new Palestinian legislative council would be scheduled uh, for uh, uh, May 22nd, if I'm, I'm correct, to be followed by the presidential elections on July 31st, and then a separate uh, and third poll uh, on August 31st uh, to select new members of the Palestinian uh, National uh, Council. Uh, the Central Elections Commission, uh, an independent or the independent agency uh, established in 2002 to manage and supervise the organization and implementation uh, of presidential and legislative elections in Palestine immediately uh, set the electoral wheels in motion. It published the legal electoral calendar for campaigning and voting, uh, initiated voter registration procedures in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem, uh, started the nomination process uh, for candidates, and made logistical arrangements to invite international observers uh, to monitor the elections and vouch uh, for uh, their integrity and their transparency. Uh, the call for election by uh, President Abbas uh, was cautiously welcomed also by uh, Palestinian political factions, including his foremost competitor, Hamas, which had uh, won the last parliamentary elections uh, back in January 2006. Uh, the movement's leaders reiterated their support for the success uh, of the 2021 uh, elections, highlighting uh, their commitment uh, to participate in the democratic process, and more importantly, to quote, uh, to accept the results of the election, end uh, of quote. Now, Palestinian public opinion has been quite clear in its demand for legislative and presidential elections over the past 15 years uh, prior to this announcement. Indeed, uh, the, the, the last all before this presidential decree conducted uh, by the uh, authoritative Ramallah-based Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research, PSR, uh, back in December 2020, confirmed that uh, more than three quarters uh, of those surveys supported holding uh, such uh, uh, elections. Uh, at the same time, uh, most of them, unfortunately, remain quite skeptical. Only 32% expected these elections uh, to actually take place soon uh, in the uh, Palestinian uh, territories. Uh, moreover, despite overwhelming skepticism and disappointment uh, in, in the leadership, including by potential candidates in these elections, most Palestinians did endorse the process and expressed uh, willingness to participate in it uh, if and when uh, these elections were to take place. Indeed, thus far, uh, more uh, than uh, 2.6 million or 93.3% of Palestinian eligible voters have uh, actually registered uh, by the declared uh, deadline. However, many, many, many questions uh, have been raised since January 15. And unfortunately, the bulk of these questions uh, remain unanswered today. Um, uh, will these elections actually take place as scheduled? I mean, e even uh, at this late stage, uh, we have to debate. Uh, it looks to me that uh, they might not uh, take place. We will know probably this week. Can you have free and democratic elections under Israeli occupation? A more kind of existential question. I mean, what is the meaning, meaning uh, of elections when you are under military occupation? 
what are the logistical challenges presented by holding elections in Palestine? And we have the ultimate person uh, to help us understand uh, this question uh, today, who has uh, organized and supervised these uh, elections in, in the past. Uh, to what extent does Israeli uh, meddling hamper these elections? Uh, do these elections reflect uh, the aspirations and, and, and hopes uh, of, of the Palestinian people? Uh, how dominant uh, is uh, factional politics? Uh, are the Palestinians destined uh, to remain uh, dominated by factional politics in the future? Uh, what are the political issues that are central uh, to, to, to this uh, campaign? Uh, who's running? Who's not running? Why? What will happen should the elections uh, fail to materialize? If indeed, uh, as announced uh, or leaked by uh, Egyptian diplomats, a uh, few hours ago, uh, five o'clock Washington time this morning, uh, it seems that uh, we're going to hear an announcement uh, to postpone uh, these uh, elections uh, on Thursday uh, uh, of this week. And should that uh, happen, uh, is there a price to pay? And who is going uh, to be paying uh, that price? Now, many, many questions and, and to help us uh, decipher all these issues, uh, we have an excellent panel today uh, with a lot of experience in, in Palestinian politics. We are going to begin in that order uh, with Dr. Hanna Nasser, who is chairperson of the Board of Trustees uh, of Birzeit uh, University, but uh, more relevant to our discussion uh, today, uh, Dr. Nasser is the chairman of the Central Elections uh, Commission uh, in, in, in Palestine, which is an independent body established uh, by the Palestinian National Authority back in 1995. Uh, he's been sharing it since uh, 2002 uh, and uh, with a lot of experience in conducting or supervising, organizing the elections in 05, 06, uh, 12, 2012, 2017, uh, and so on. So we're looking forward uh, to, to his remarks. Uh, following Dr. Hanna, uh, we are going to hear uh, from Dr. Khalil Shifafi. Uh, Khalil is uh, well known uh, as a prominent academic and author, uh, and uh, one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent pollster uh, in, in Palestine. He's been doing that uh, actually for the past three decades, uh, where his polls uh, have been the most authoritative. Uh, polls uh, internally in, in Palestine, uh, in addition to his, of course, uh, academic and, and research uh, contribution uh, to the state of affairs uh, in Palestine beyond PSR or the Center, the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey uh, Research uh, based in, in Ramallah. Uh, third uh, will be my colleague from uh, Arab Center, Dr. Dana al -Kurd. Uh, a writer, and uh, of course, uh, she uh, she holds a PhD uh, in uh, government from the University of Texas in Austin. She's currently, uh, as I said, a researcher uh, at the Arab Center for Research and Policy, Policy Stu Studies uh, in uh, uh, Doha, and she's assistant professor uh, at the uh, institute uh, there in uh, the institute, uh, the Doha Institute for graduate studies uh, uh, in, uh, in Qatar. She specializes in comparative politics and international relations. And she is the author of uh, a very interesting, intriguing uh, book that she published uh, a couple of years back uh, by Oxford uh, University and Hearst Publishers entitled uh, Polarized and Demobilized Legacies of Authoritarianism uh, in Palestine. And last but not least, uh, our friend Dalia Hatuka. Uh, Dalia is a multimedia journalist uh, specializing in Israeli-Palestinian affairs and regional uh, Middle East issues uh, as they pertain to both business, economics, uh, culture, art, uh, and definitely US foreign policy. Her articles uh, on the region uh, are very authoritative and much appreciated in terms of thoroughness and accuracy. Uh, and uh, very informative for those of us who follow uh, events in the region uh, on a daily, uh, basis, uh, daily basis. Uh, she is the winner of many awards uh, in terms of uh, her professional coverage uh, of the region, and we are delighted uh, that she decided to join us uh, today. Uh, and uh, we're gonna go ahead, I think the most logical uh, process um, 
uh, is for Dr. Nasser to begin with the challenges, the practical challenges of, of putting together uh, an election process uh, like this one, the predictability and unpredictability uh, of the situation uh, there in Palestine. And then we will proceed uh, further. Uh, your participation is appreciated. I know several hundred people uh, have uh, joined us today. Uh, your participation in terms of questions uh, would be welcome, particularly during the Q&A, but feel free to address uh, your question to any uh, of our uh, participants today, speakers, and I'll be more than delighted uh, to read your question and address it, address it to the uh, participant that you have uh, targeted uh, with, with your uh, question. Uh, you, you might uh, do that uh, uh, by uh, clicking on the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the page, or you might send an email uh, to, uh, uh, to our email at ArabCenterDC. Uh, dot org. And at this time, uh, Dr. Hanna Nasser, uh, welcome. And the microphone is yours, sir. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Khalil. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, at the Elections Commission, business is as usual. We'll continue to work until we hear anything that uh, will stop the election process. The election process is extremely important at this moment. As you know, for the last 15 years, democracy has been uh, sort of grounded in Palestine, totally grounded. Uh, not only grounded, we had also the conflict between Hamas and Fatah. The country has been split into two factions, uh, Gaza on one side and the West Bank uh, on the other side. And we had governments on both sides. We had uh, governmental decrees on both sides that are I don't want to say illegal, but they don't have a base of a legislative council uh, to uphold them. So the process of election will hopefully uh, uh, kill two stones with uh, uh, two birds with one stone. We will revive our democracy, and we will end this uh, extremely on on uh, uh, extremely difficult conflict between Gaza and the West Bank. And if we can do that. Then I don't. I think we would have achieved tremendous amount of success in our operation. Uh, I will speak only a few uh, about few things, and then I'll tackle some of the issues that you spoke about, Khalil. But uh, I want to give uh, brief information about the situation. The country is energized beyond my uh, uh, my expectation. Ninety three percent of the population or the people who are eligible to vote have registered for voting. Of course, we help them in doing that by doing it also capable to do it electronically. But the most important thing is that there is an energized community that has not been able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to elect or to have any democratic process in the country for the last 15 years. At least 1 million of these people have never elected, uh, uh, have never voted before. So we have an energized one. And as a result of that energy, we have about, um, thir not about, we have 36 parties that have been formed. Some of them were, as you know, split from Fatah. There's Fatah 1, Fatah 2, Fatah 3. Of course, they call themselves different names, but essentially Fatah has split. This is not a new phenomenon in the Palestinian affairs. You've seen how the PFLP and PFLO and all these P, <laughs> the, the various factions over the number of years, they have split from one into the other into the other. And in the elections now, we have split of Fatah into various uh, 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 lists. 36 of the lists, uh, most of them are really uh, lists of uh, non-party lists. I mean, independent uh, people who have formed uh, maybe families, maybe large, uh, large tribes of uh, families, and so on. But the basic family, the basic parties have mostly, most of them have engaged in forming uh, 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 a party. I'm sure Khalil will talk more about uh, this kind of thing. The we apologize for the uh, interruption there. Uh, unfortunately, we, we kind of expected the line to be a bit weak uh, uh, from. Uh, the, the West Bank there, but uh, we hope it will uh, resume rather uh, uh, quickly. Khalil, uh, uh, okay. 
Could you help us with uh, at least understanding uh, public opinion? How do the Palestinians uh, feel uh, about these elections? Yes, they have registered uh, to, to vote, but uh, in a significant in significant numbers. Uh, but at the same time, your polls indicate that they were very, very skeptical, right? That is true. Uh, the skepticism has been uh, very high in December, as you indicated, Khalil, but in March, actually, expectations uh, rose significantly. In mm. fact, expectations that elections will take place doubled to more than 6% uh, just a few weeks ago. My guess, of course, is that today expectations are back uh, to 20, maybe 30%, if, if we're lucky, given all the talk about uh, the, the cancellation or postponement of the elections. One thing that is also positive about the recent findings in March is the concern we had earlier about the youth and youth participation. Palestinian youth tend to be extremely skeptical about governance, and we find a tremendous amount of discontent among those who are between the ages of 18 and, and 29, what we call the youth. Um, but in fact, in March, we found that a large percentage of the youth uh, are indicating that they want to vote and that they know uh, how they intend to vote. Uh, this is more in the Gaza Strip than in the West Bank, uh, but, but even in the West Bank, the percentage is higher than expected. It's not extremely high. And now I'm just referring to, to, to those young people, uh, 18 and, and, and 29. However, um, we do have some bad news from the public. Uh, I, I, of course, wish if Hannah is, is listening because this applies to him a little bit. Um, most Palestinians uh, believe these elections will not be fair and free. Now, um, th there are various reasons why they think that. One, of course, is something that Hannah has indicated in, in what he had already told us. The Palestinian Authority is not a democratic regime. Uh, only 20% or less of the Palestinians think Palestinians have a democracy. So the expectation is, well, if you don't have a democracy, elections usually are not real elections. And so there is significant public belief that, uh, well, we might have elections, but uh, we still don't have a democracy and will not have a democracy after elections. The second issue that is, uh, that is leading people to, to reach the conclusion that elections will not be free and fair is the split between the West Bank and Gaza. Um, will the opposition party in, in, in Gaza or in the West Bank in Gaza, this would be Fatah, and the West Bank, this would be Hamas. Will they indeed have the ability to campaign? Most Palestinians say, of course not. A third reason for that is that only about half trust the police in Gaza or trust the police in the West Bank uh, to, to treat the process with integrity or neutrality, so again, related to the split. And, and the fourth, if I'm not mistaken, is the belief that the factions, Fadih and Hamas, are not democratic. That is the verdict of the overwhelming majority of the public. 70% say if Hamas wins the elections, Fadih will reject the outcome. 60% say if Fadih wins the elections, Hamas will reject the outcome. That is a condemnation of the, the largest two political factions. Uh, the, the fifth uh, is Israel, and the expectation that Israel's role in the, in the process will be destructive, that it will try to arrest our uh, candidates. And even if these candidates win, Israel will probably arrest uh, those parliamentarians. Finally, the, the, on the election commission, that is the part in particular that applies to Hanna. Only half of the public has confidence in the ability of the election commission to manage the process. The belief is in Gaza, Hamas will dictate to the commission what to do and that the commission will not have the capacity to resist the pressure 
Similarly, in the West Bank, that Farah and Abbas will force the commission to do things uh, or that the commission will have to swallow this kind of pressure uh, from the factions. So this is a concern that the commission is not strong enough to be able to force its way as an independent commission as is expected from an independent commission. So that is where the public is with regard to the, 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 the process itself. What, with regard to electoral behavior, how will people vote, in other words? Well, we're essentially finding two major drivers. One is the values. That is, for example, these people who are religious will certainly be voting a lot more to Hamas than they will vote for Farah or some of the other factions. Um, but we are also finding that people have priorities and they know what these priorities are and they are able to identify which faction is the one that is most able to produce the outcome they want to address the priority they have identified. We also find, although these are the two most important, we find some demographic issues. For example, young people. Uh, and this is, by the way, uh, a very dramatic change from where things were in 2006. Young people have abandoned Hamas. Hamas's greatest uh, failure during the last 14, 15 years is that it has not been able to keep uh, the greater support that it had received in the past from Palestinian youth. This is not to say that Palestinian youth are interested in voting more for, uh, say, Farah. Um, they are more interested in some Farah figures like Marwan Barghouti uh, or his list in the, in the parliamentary elections, um, but they definitely are not interested in voting for Abbas. Um, women, another demographic factor that we find to be important, uh, women tend to vote for Hamas more than they vote for Farah. Uh, th this, although has somewhat uh, changed a bit, uh, we still expect more women to be voting uh, for Hamas than for Farah. If you look at all the attitudes, what kind of conclusions would one uh, come to based on these attitudes? There are three main conclusions that I can outline. Uh, one is that Farah is much better in terms of addressing the priorities, particularly the priorities that, uh, that are related to the economy and the priority that is related to ending the siege and, and blockade of Gaza. On these two issues, uh, there is significant public concern that Hamas will make things way much worse than they are currently uh, if it wins the elections. So this is bad, really bad news for, for Hamas. Um, bad news for Farah is that the public still believes uh, Farah and the PA uh, to be corrupt. Um, still, this is, by the way, not as bad as it used to be in 2005 before the 2006 elections, because today, um, a lot of people also think Hamas is corrupt. Still, not as bad as Farah. So in terms of priorities, if the top priority is corruption, for those who say the top priority is addressing or combating corruption, more of those will vote for Hamas than they would vote for Farah. Um, the, 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 there is one fundamental priority. This is priority number one, where Farah is slightly better uh, in, in terms of, of expectations of the public, and that is the unification of the West Bank and Gaza. Um, overall, particularly in Gaza, uh, we find that Farah is expected to do better in helping to unify the West Bank and Gaza than Hamas. This, the issue of unification, is extremely significant for voting behavior, particularly in Gaza, and Farah is definitely winning uh, more uh, than expected in Gaza because of, of this particular expectation. Uh, the second conclusion uh, from the findings is that 
neither Fatih nor Hamas will have a majority. Uh, there is a zero chance that Fatih will win a majority of the states. There is a zero chance that Hamas will win the majority of the states. Uh, uh, we expect Fatih to do better uh, than Hamas or to do as well as Hamas. And now I'm referring to the official Fatih list. As Hannah indicated before we lost him, um, there are three Fatih. In fact, there are more than three Fatih, but for the sake of argument, let's say there are three Fatih. Um, the, the, the Fatih uh, 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 that is called the, the, the future is the one that is uh, led by Dahlan, although he's not a candidate. Dahlan is very popular in Gaza and he will do very well in Gaza. He's not as popular in the West Bank, but we expect him to win somewhere between five to 10%. Um, we also expect uh, the list uh, by Qudwa, Nasser of Qudwa and uh, uh, Fadwa al barghuti This is the Barghuti list or the list of combination of Barghuti Fadwa. Um, this list has the greatest uh, room for growth uh, and, 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 and getting more and more support um, because Barhuti, Marwan Barhuti, is an extreme, he is by far the most popular Palestinian leader. He is definitely the one who will win the presidential elections if and when they take place. There is absolutely no question about that. Um, so if, if the Qudwa Barhuti list is successful in presenting itself as the Marwan Barouti's list, it will have the greatest chance of actually changing what I've just said earlier about this being Farah and Hamas winning. Uh, it could be a three-way in this case with Farah, Hamas, and, and Qudwa Barouti and Dahlan working together. In fact, we could see a situation in which Dahlan and, and, and Qudwa Barouti would have more votes than the official Farah list. Um, in, in all cases, if you combine the three Farah lists, the official and the non-official, we expect them to win up to half of the seats of the, uh, um, of the parliament. Um, now, there, there, there is no doubt that there is a great deal of uncertainty, particularly with regard to third parties other than what I've just mentioned. And of course, I've considered Dahlan and, and Fudwa Barouti to be Farah in this case. Um, third parties are not expected to do well. Um, this could change, of course, um, given the, the election campaign. Um, but so far, there is no evidence from our survey that third parties will do better than what they have done in 2006. In 2006, they won 15% of the popular vote. This time, this would give them 15% of the seats because of the change in the electoral system. This change in the electoral system is the one change that eliminates, completely eliminates the prospect of Hamas winning the elections. Uh, and it gives Farah the prospect of winning the election by forming a coalition with other Farah uh, lists or those uh, third parties who might win the elections. The third parties um, that are likely to win the elections are, are those that have won elections in the past, such as the PFLP, uh, Al Mubadara of Muslim Barghouti, um, and, and few others. Um, for, for the overwhelming majority of the new independent lists, our surveys so far show they are not likely to do well, um, but it is uh, way too early, assuming that elections do proceed forward, as, as Hannah said, um, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil, I appreciate that. Uh... Next uh, will be uh, Dr. Dana uh, uh The microphone is yours, Dana. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. And uh, I'm gonna um, kind of touch on what Dr. Khalil has so, uh, um, you know, uh, 
covered so well with his presentation, but I'll be talking more also about kind of the long term implications, the political implications of these elections and and the status quo more generally, um, which um, I argue these elections don't resolve. Um, so just to begin kind of, you know, with my academic hat on, um, we have a lot of research on um, processes of demobilization and a lot of debate on how, um, you know, movements are uh, demobilized kind of from the outside, whether it's state repression or resource deprivation. And I think in the case of Palestine, we often look at these, you know, exogenous factors without considering as much the long-term effects of these internal factors that are also, um, uh, you know, demobilizing and, and kind of killing the movement. Um, but there are also ways that movements can fail and become demobilized because of internal issues. Um, so uh, here I'm, I'm uh, uh, referring to Christian Davenport's uh, work in his book, How Social Movements Die, where he looks at five different factors, um, burnout, uh, factionalization or polarization, lost commitment, membership loss, and rigidity of the institution. Um, so just to you know, very briefly kind of touch on um, these points, Burnout is, I think, pretty understandable um, for, for all of us. It's, it's kind of a common layman's term, but people stop participating and engaging to kind of escape the stress of the daily struggle. Polarization and factionalization is the internal divisions that fracture a movement. Uh, the third lost commitment is a little bit different. Um, it's when people kind of lose the emotional attachment and sense of moral obligation to, to kind of a, a, a particular struggle or cause. And then membership loss is the inability to acquire and retain new people. And finally, rigidity here, because he's discussing, or, uh, you know, social movement organizations specifically, but I think it speaks to some of the institutions we have in Palestine as well, um, where organization structures develop a sort of functional stickiness. Um, so I'm quoting here, decisions become centralized around a smaller number of individuals, and communication tends to become one way, as information is provided to those in control, but little is provided back to those outside of the core. So, um, kind of with that in mind, I've argued in my own work how certain types of repression, um, particularly from within, uh, uh, you know, um, from, from uh, Palestinian actors specifically, leads to polarization that has major impacts on how well Palestinians can coordinate around shared grievances and coordinate across the political spectrum. Um, but the risk with these elections, I think, if they move forward, I, you know, we're hearing reports uh, just even a few minutes ago that they, um, they might be, um, that they might be postponed, but, um, you know, is, is to go their impact is to go beyond the polarization aspect um, and, and trigger or exacerbate a number of these other factors that I was discussing, particularly among the youth. Um, because you know these elections, I think it's pretty clear they're kind of intended to provide legit legitimacy for um, the Palestinian Authority internationally, perhaps more than domestically, but they're problematic because one, they can't guarantee international support and two, they can't guarantee domestic legitimacy. And I think Khalil's um, uh, polling uh, speaks to that. Um, and so beginning with the first point, you know, international support isn't forthcoming. Um, I, I think there was a meeting today between, uh, you know, um, uh, different European ambassadors and the, the Israeli uh, uh, um, officials in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs about how, you know, they should not um, uh, impede these elections and things like this. And I mean, we, we have no guarantee that that's going to happen. East Jerusalem is still a question. And then the, the Biden administration hasn't been, um, uh, you know, fully supportive of, of every outcome of this election. So that's a huge elephant in the room that that this is not going to be um, that that might lead to issues and, and is not going to be resolved. And then secondly, I think as has been alluded to a number of times in this discussion that these elections are being held under the context of increased repression in a system where opposition has not been allowed a space to develop and where the official parties themselves seem happy to coordinate to entrench the status quo. So I, I really consider, you know, at this point, Hamas is often kind of painted as the opposition party to Fatah, but at this point, they really are both uh, you know, part of the 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 the, the status quo um, in both their respective spheres, and so under under these conditions, elections, even if there isn't outright fraud, um, cannot be necessarily legitimate and won't be read as legitimate by by the Palestinian public. And I don't mean um, you know to claim that elections are you know all bad or that we oppose them under any circumstances in the Palestinian context, but it's it's just that a focus on elections. I think can distract from you know, the real work that needs to be done to rejuvenate effective mobilization around the Palestinian cause uh, internally. And it gives people the sense that you know, if this is their main outlet for their political grievance, and then event inevitably when this outlet disappoints, either because the elections get postponed or because the elections don't go you know, 
well, it can lead to all of the factors I was discussing, you know, burnout and a loss of commitment and serious problems we haven't fully considered, considered um, in terms of um, long-term support for and use of um, armed, armed strategies and violent strategies. So um, you know, on top of that, we have research that shows, um, you know, deliberative engagement is key to combating alienation and political apathy. Um, and deliberative engagement here means kind of face-to-face -face in spaces that build social ties and facilitate connection. Um, and, and the function of, of socialization here is, is key to facilitating the success of this. And in Palestine, we can see that this has been discouraged. Um, you know, alternatives to the political parties aren't really given a space to function adequately. And the political parties themselves don't necessarily serve as a space for any kind of rejuvenation of ideas or inclusion of new people. I mean, Tarat Dana has some work on this related to Fatah's internal party structure, but I think it speaks to the broader um, political spectrum. And, and again, this is reflected in public opinion as Dr. Khalil has, has, has uh, um, you know, very well uh, uh, laid out. And in, in some of the Arab Opinion Index's own polling um, from the Arab Center, um, so we polled in 2019 in Palestine, we found that only 23% of the Palestinian public has any level of trust with political parties. So a full 70% distrust them to some degree. Um, and then when it comes to official institutions of the PA, only 8% of Palestinians feel the government represents all citizens equally. And 58% that the PA think that the PA does not represent public opinion to any degree. Um, and finally, when asked directly about whether they would participate in elections, at the time, so this was uh, done at the beginning of 2019, 43% of Palestinians said they wouldn't. And among that 43%, the most common reason cited was that elections are useless. Um, so this doesn't necessarily contradict anything that we're seeing in polling today, because when we asked people kind of their, you know, whether they support the idea of elections. And I think that's the crucial difference is that, you know, these elections are just the idea of elections as kind of a concept in terms of choosing political leadership. 72% um, of Palestinians on that question um, believe that, you know, free and like consistent elections should be the way to choose political leadership. They just don't have faith in the elections in the current context. So among this population um, with this kind of baseline of views, uh, born out of a stagnating political situation for decades, you tell this population that elections are key and that these elections are where they should put their effort. I really think that this kind of situation poses a real risk to exacerbating apathy and alienation, especially amongst um, you know, younger generations, which is again, born out in public opinion polls that um, uh, the Palestinian Center for Survey and Policy Research has, has conducted as, as recently as March. Um, and so this has ramifications on how Palestinians engage with um, the Palestinian cause in the future. It can breed a sense of fatalism and, and desperation among certain segments of society. Um, it can um, hasten attempts to leave and migrate, and it can and you know make people more supportive of um, drastic measures, you know, armed resistance to the occupation, even as resources and capacity for armed resistance are greatly diminished. And coordination across political groups is at an all-time low, which is kind of essential to an effective strategy, armed or not. So um, in the same poll that I was just mentioning in 2019, um, armed resistance was actually the most popular option among, uh, among respondents in terms of strategies moving forward. Um, and I, again, that's corroborated in, in, in recent polling as well, and especially among the youth. And then being affiliated with a political party made a person in this particular poll more likely to support armed resistance. So this really speaks to that alienation. Even those affiliated with some venues for political participation can tell that these are ineffective venues. So, you know, we, that's kind of the situation we find ourselves in. Um, so, so in the end, we, you know, those of us who um, care about challenging the status quo rather than per perpetuating it um, should be, you know, pushing and advocating for increased space for political alternatives and deliberative engagement starting at, you know, the local, you know, grassroots level and supporting initiatives such as the one that uh, recently uh, was launched, Jil Tajdeed, and attempts to revitalize the PLO and alternative institutions to the PA, because elections can't be the only way to do that, you know, um, taking the spotlight for months away from all of these other percolating issues um, as the political parties deliberate and possibly kick the can down the road of what really needs to be done. It's, it's really, it's really um, not, not sustainable and, and a, a, I don't think a good use of, of anyone's time. So um, I, I argue, I think that it's what I'm, what I'm suggesting instead is not even the best way forward. It's, it's really the only way forward because perpetuation of the status quo 
will be catastrophic on, uh, on a number of different levels, including, you know, most importantly to internal Palestinian politics. Um, so I, that's, that's all I have, but I can kind of, um, you know, uh, speak more to the polling and things like that in, in some of the Q&A. Uh, thank you, uh, Dana. I appreciate uh, your uh, analysis, particularly at this new angle, I think, relatively speaking, of uh, the status quo being the enemy here. Uh, will, I think, gain uh, a lot more emphasis uh, as we uh, uh, cope with the impact or the fallout uh, from uh, cancellation or postponement, uh, if that is the option uh, that we will be hearing uh, on uh, Thursday. Uh, we're still trying to connect, or, or Dr. Hanna is still trying to connect back uh, with us. He's having some uh, technical difficulties. We hope uh, that he will be able to rejoin us. Uh, before the end of the, this program. At this stage, uh, however, let's go to Dahlia. Uh, Dahlia, the microphone is yours. Uh, what's your analysis uh, with regards to what you've heard thus far or what you have been witnessing uh, day in, day out uh, from your uh, coverage of the situation there in Palestine? Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be uh, here with uh... Uh, this esteemed panel. Um, I, I'd like to speak about uh, the likelihood of the elections taking place, uh, touching upon uh, the running lists, the platforms, and the internal relations and conflicts. I think for some time now, uh, the PA was paving the way for canceling the elections. Now, it, I, I would have said it was slowly paving the way, but now it's surely paving the way for cancellation. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious that the PA was never serious about democratic and free elections in the first place, and it was only a matter of time before this happened. Um, the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas is now using Jerusalem as a pretext for this, saying that there will be no elections if Israeli authorities don't allow the vote to take place in East Jerusalem. Um, as uh, some other panelists mentioned, it's expected that the election cancellation announcement uh, will be made uh, by the end of this week on Thursday, uh, to be exact, because there's a meeting for the Palestinian leadership. And it also happens to be one day before the lists or the electoral lists can launch their election campaigns. Uh, the truth is, or, or at least part of it, is that uh, this has to do with Fatih's own internal mess. I know some people would like to um, blame some of this on Hamas, uh, but I, I would say that this starts with Fatih. Um, I never believed that Abbas would participate in a process that he couldn't scuttle whenever he wanted to. Uh, that is to say he was okay with the elections as long as he was able to control the result. Um, and this is why Nasser al-Qudwa's list uh, entering is a wild card, and Hamad Dahlan's list also. Now, the latter Abbas was ready to handle, um, but al-Qudwa, with the support of Marwan Barghouti, complicates things quite a bit in that respect. Now, this isn't the first time since 2006 that the PA has called elections, but in the past, there, were, there always seemed to be a reason to call them off. Uh, sometimes the issues were logistical, other times they were political. Um, if we look back as far as 2006, however, it can be assumed or it's a safe assumption that the 2021 elections won't take place. Um, as uh, Dr. Hanna Nasser was saying, in no, um, as Dr. Hanna Nasser was saying, uh, although more than 90% of eligible voters in the West Bank and Gaza have registered with the Central Elections Commission, uh, it's obvious that the election can, can still be canceled. And this is the general expectation now that I'm hearing from Palestinians on the ground. Uh, now, Palestinians are used to canceled elections at this point, but the hype and the excitement and the fact that Palestinians have come so close to being able to have a say in their political future uh, means canceling this election uh, this time around, it will be different. Uh, Nasser al-Qudwa's list, uh, for example, yesterday, or today rather, uh, along with 14 other lists and civil society representatives, sent a letter to Abbas, uh, making it clear that they will not take this decision by him lying down. Uh, they're insisting that elections taking place. They're saying that this is 
that there is a duty to ensure that Palestinians exercise their constitutional right to choose who represents, uh, who represents them. Now, um, several Palestinian factions have said they will not support the elections. Uh, I'll, I'll name a few, the P PFLP, the DFLP, uh, Mustafa al-Barhuti's al-Mubadara, Islamic Jihad, even though they said that they would not um, partake in the elections, and Hamas. Um, I think it may be safe to say that we may see demonstrations should the elections be canceled. And Hamas may want to up the ante if or when rather the elections are called off. Uh, or at least that's what Fatah, Israel and some regional powers are fearing. Uh, this is why Abbas has decided to dispatch Hussein al-Sheikh to Doha within the next 24 hours to meet Qatari officials to, con to convince, um, reportedly convince Hamas's leadership not to escalate the situation should the elections uh, be called off. Now, it's worth noting that the parties that support having the elections postponed, I think it might be seven out of 13, uh, they don't have the electoral lists, they don't have any electoral lists running. And those who have will probably not reach the threshold needed to gain any seats in parliament. Um, Abbas wants to call off the elections, despite the fact that uh, in Cairo, Fatah and Hamas reached an agreement uh, over the elections. It shows that Abbas insists on doing his own thing, that he's um, judge, jury, and executioner, and he's dismissing Hamas or any other parties that don't want to agree with him. Now, I think there's another very important uh, party that we should mention. Um, it's Israel. But before I get to that, I, I'd like to speak about the Americans. Um, the Americans haven't exactly been uh, forthcoming or supportive with the idea of free and fair elections in Palestine, much like in 2006. Um, in an interview with Saeed Ariqat of the Palestinian Al-Quds newspaper, an anonymous Biden official said that, and I quote, all signs indicate that the multiple divisions within Fatah will reduce its ability to mobilize the Palestinians in a way that enables them to defeat Hamas. So again, the US is showing us that it only supports democracy in Palestine if it yields the outcome it desires. And that's why Washington, the official said, will look with understanding at the possibility of postponing the elections for some time. So basically, Washington has not learned much from the 2006 parliamentary elections and they're okay with postponing them until the Biden administration is confident that the US's favorite can favored candidates will win. Um, this anonymous official also made it clear that this is because Hamas does not support a two state solution, but that's not even true. On several occasions in, in the past years, Hamas has made it clear that it will accept a solution based on the 1967 armistice line. But even then, the Likud, which has been running Israel for more than a decade now, opposes the two-state solution, and they've gotten nothing but support from the U.S. despite their stance. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. isn't the only culprit, uh, culprit of course. Uh, there's Israel, and it remains silent, eerily silent, on whether it will allow elections to take place in East Jerusalem, which it controls. But its silence has also been matched with detaining candidates in East Jerusalem who are considering running and preventing election related events from happening there. I believe they've already scuttled two election related events uh, in East Jerusalem. There has also been some media reports that Israeli authorities informed the PA through Kogat or the military arm, um, the Israeli military arm responsible for civilian affairs in the territories, that they will not allow elections to take place in Jerusalem. But so far, no one has gone on, on the record to say it as much. Um, and lastly, I'd like to talk about a little bit about how it was easy to kind of see from the get go that these elections would not take place. Apart from what I just mentioned, uh, there's the matter of the intra-Palestinian rift, which made it nearly impossible to hold elections at a, at a previous time. Uh, I think even if the elections are to take place, we still uh, have uh, several problems. One of them is that Fatah and Hamas have not yet agreed on the security apparatus 
responsible for securing the vote and on which court would preside over potential legal disputes. Um, and I believe one of our panelists mentioned this as well, uh, the, the question of how could both parties guarantee that the elections will be free and fair in the respective areas they administer. Hamas has a poor track record of tolerating dissent or even different political opinions, while Abbas has forbidden anyone from the party's um, Central Committee and Revolutionary Council from submitting their candidacy for the official Fatah slate. And from the beginning, we were hearing on the ground um, reports from the ground that Abbas may use the COVID-19 pandemic as a justification for delaying the elections yet again. So this proves to us that he was never serious about the elections if he couldn't control the outcome. Um, and that's why it's worth looking at the changes Abbas decreed that restrict the possibility of running. This includes changing the age of candidacy, the high fees involved, um, the fact that anybody who wants to run has to resign from his or her job. So to clarify, an, amaid an amendment um, made to the election law stipulates that anyone who wants to run in a slate must get written consent from their workplace to resign. This means people will lose their livelihood to run. There's also a fear that permission to resign will not be granted to those that Abbas doesn't want to run, which effectively lets him handpick who will compete against his party. And finally, um, I'd like to say that many Palestinians from the get-go feared that there were too many obstacles existing and new for the elections to be held. Um, in February, there was evidence of voter registration tampering, but the issue was rectified very quickly. Uh, I think, however, it did mark uh, a bad omen of things to come. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Islamic Jihad said it will boycott the elections, while Hamas is facing a crackdown on its members by Israel and the PA in the West Bank. And it's also unclear whether Fatah and Hamas will release all detained political members from their respective prisons, as they mentioned. Um, these, are, uh, these are some of the key points that uh, I wanted to mention for now, and I'm happy to take anybody's uh, questions uh, during the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dalia, for your excellent uh, analysis and uh, broad uh, set of issues uh, that you have uh, covered in, in a relatively short, uh, short time, so we thank you. Uh, for that. Uh, we're delighted that uh, Dr. Hanna has been able to rejoin us. We're at the mercy of technology <laughs> these days. Uh, Dr. Hanna, go ahead, please. Uh, hey, I, I think by now I, I cannot really, because there has been a lot of discussion, the only thing I want to comment about is really on the Jerusalem issue, really. That's, that's sure. my, my main uh, issue. Of course, there are uh, difficulties, uh, obstacles, not only by the Israelis, I will mention that uh, in a moment, but the Palestinians have to be assured that the results of the elections are respected by the various parties. Mm -hmm. To that effect, we have made uh, a code of honor uh, where, where everybody signs that. And normally, normally I say, during the last three elections, legislative elections and presidential elections, there was no really fraud in the elections. I have to admit, people accepted the results of the elections uh, easily. And one of the reasons, I don't want to give myself, to pat myself on the shoulder, uh, there is a lot of um, respect for the integrity of the uh, CEC, the Elections Commission, and therefore, in general, people accept the results. They accept them because there is a lot of, I mean, part of the things you wanted to ask about integrity, because we have a lot of uh, uh, people from the various societies and so on who monitor the elections and we use a very simple situation uh, very simple process for elections and so it is prone i mean it's very difficult to have fraud in uh, in our election system but really the palestinians accept the results of the elections the biggest prob the bigger problem is the international community the international community that supports elections, uh, and they go to extents beyond my imagination in supporting elections, yet at the same time, they do not accept the results of the elections. And that's a dilemma that I have discussed a lot with the Europeans especially, and even with the Americans in the 1996 elections, 
whether they will accept the results or not. And of course, as you know, they have not accepted. Uh, it's interesting to say that in 1990, in 2006, uh, Abbas accepted the results of the elections and he handed over the country, the, 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 the government to uh, Smail Haniyeh. So really on this side, we have a certain amount of clarity. With the Israelis, there is a protocol. The protocol is, in my opinion, is a bad uh, protocol. But that protocol was made in 1996, a protocol about elections in Jerusalem. That protocol was initiated in 1995, especially for the 1996 elections. It was supposed to be for one time. After that one time, Jerusalem was to be re resolved. The issue of Jerusalem was supposed to be resolved. It wasn't resolved. And in 2005, we used the same protocol, which means people go to the post office boxes in Israel and do their voting. And in 2006, we did the same thing. And now this uh, unfortunate kind of protocol has become uh, something that the Palestinians are requesting that the Israelis have to abide by that protocol. That protocol by itself is really uh, is, is not the best kind of operation for elections in Jerusalem, but for some reason, uh, it has been given a certain halo that this is the way we want to have our elections uh, 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 in Jerusalem. And up till today, the Israelis have not accepted, and therefore the chances of uh, the elections being uh, being canceled is a high uh, is a high uh, uh, probability. I will only want to make one final thing about uh, the elections. Of course, democracy and occupation don't exist uh, uh, for a long period of time. And our fight for democracy huh, should be also a fight for democracy and at the same time for liberation of the country. I think we have, our generation has failed in the liberation of the country. I hope we will not fail at least in the, uh, in the democratization, which is an essential part of the liberation. I hope we will keep for our next generation a democratic country that will have the basis for the liberation uh, of our country. I, I want to stop at that level, but I will want, I will, because I've lost a lot of what you have said, I, if there are any questions, I would be ready to say. I want to make only one minor comment uh, on the last speaker about the laws. The laws concerning resi resignation have been installed in the law, the election law, since 1996. And it is one of the worst items in the law that people have to resign, but it is not the work of Mr. Abbas. It has been initiated in 1996 and in 2005 and in 2006 and in the present elections. So it has been a continuing one and we want to work very hard in order to eliminate that uh, this kind of uh, a law. I will stop at that level. I will send you my paper in full so that because I missed a lot on, on issues, but I will take any questions if there are uh, any questions addressed to me. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Nasser. I appreciate the fact that uh, you resumed uh, your presentation after this unfortunate uh, technical interruption. Uh, let's go ahead and move now to the Q&A session. And again, I would like to remind a couple of hundred people that uh, remain uh, participating in this uh, event that we welcome your questions. Uh, we have received quite a few already, but we will welcome some more. And uh, we will spend the next 30 minutes uh, trying to uh, respond to these uh, questions. Please use the uh, Q&A uh, format uh, on your, uh, the bottom of your page there. Uh, or send an email to uh, uh, the center, uh, email at arabcenterdc.org, uh, and uh, it will be transferred uh, to me to read uh, to our uh, guests here. Uh, the first question we have is from uh, Dayala Asid, uh, addressed to Khalil Shikati. Can you explain why women would vote for Hamas more than Fatah? Thank you. Uh, well, the answer is very simple. 
Palestinian women tend to be more religious than Palestinian men. And we find that overall, uh, if you are religious, you are more likely to vote for Hamas than to vote for anybody else. So religiosity seems to be the most um, important issue. I can perhaps add that in families that are conservative, um, we also see the same trend. Conservative families tend to uh, behave the same manner as religious families. And in these conservative families, uh, there is an added component that essentially dictates the women how to vote. Uh, so religiosity and conservatism seem to work hand in hand to serve uh, uh, Hamas's interest when it comes to the uh, vote of women. Uh, thank you, Khalil. The next question comes from Iman El Banna, and I'd like to uh, split this one uh, between uh, Dahlia and uh, Dana. Uh, the question goes, uh, following the tensions in Jerusalem and demonstrations in solidarity that took place across Gaza, the West Bank, and elsewhere, what are the odds that we could see a new broad-based popular mobilization uh, across Palestine by the Palestinians in the near term, especially in combination with separate pr protest movements taking place in Palestine, like in Yaffa and Umm al Fahim on, on the inside. Is there a linkage uh, potentially uh, there? Uh, Dalia and, and Dana, feel free to take a jab at that, please. Dalia? Um, I think that there is some hope um, that. Um, uh, the cancellation of the elections will reignite some, some of that fervor. Um, I've seen that a lot of uh, Palestinians are very excited, very motivated, especially young Palestinians, to partake in these elections, considering that it has been more than 15 years. And I think that um, while the Israelis would like to draw a line between Palestinians inside Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, um, that line is blurred and we've seen how support for Palestinians in East Jerusalem in the past few days uh, from the West Bank and Gaza has been enormous. Um, uh, so I think that uh, canceling the elections would be um, a very big problem at this uh, stage, especially because um, there's also, as I mentioned, like been uh, efforts by younger folks uh, to run and those have been met uh, with restrictive measures that have prevented them from doing so. Um, I believe it was Dana, and maybe she can um, speak to this uh, 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 in a few minutes. Um, uh, she mentioned the Generation for Democratic Renewal or Gil Tajdida Demokrati. It's a youth led political initiative. Uh, it's not running in the May uh, legislative elections. Uh, due to legal restrictions that prohibit uh, many younger Palestinians from running and uh, their inability to participate directly in the Palestinian National Council or the PNC. So instead, um, uh, what this uh, uh, political uh, initiative has done is that they've launched a virtual par parliamentary list. It's made up of young Palestinians running on what it describes as an inclusive and democratic political program. It's open to candidates between the ages of 18 and 45 years old. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a virtual list. Uh, it's not gonna contest the legislative elections, but it's designed to act as an incubator for future youth-led uh, political mobili mobilization. So I think, um, as I mentioned, just to reiterate, I, I think that anything that happens in the West Bank will reverberate in um, inside the Green Line and vice versa. So um, uh, at, at this point, I think uh, we have to wait for Thursday and see what happens uh, uh, in terms of the uh, results of the uh, Palestinian leadership meeting. Anna? Yeah, um, so... I think that we need to kind of make a distinction between protests happening and a broad-based, you know, mo you know, movement. Th those are kind of two separate things. I think that protests can happen. Um, Palestinians have protested in the past, um, whether it's uh, you know to 
to address Israeli um, uh, uh, violations in whether it's in East Jerusalem and things like that. And you know, we had like the teachers' unions. We we we've had like a couple of different um, uh, um, small scale, let's say, uh, in terms of scope protests. Um, but we haven't had kind of a broad based movement in the same way that we <laughs> once had in Palestinian history, in Palestinian modern history. And I argue that you know the 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 geographical and political um, fragmentation that has occurred as a result of um, as a result of essentially the international community supporting the Palestinian Authority after 2007 and uh, consolidating the Palestinian Authority's control has, um, you know, actively destroyed the ability of Palestinians to coordinate at that scale that we, we, you know, we once saw. Um, now that doesn't mean that there's, you know, no political agency and that like people won't be able to do that in the future. Um, there are these initiatives like, like uh, Dalia was mentioning, um, that can serve as, um, you know, the, the, the first steps to, to um, uh, creating, you know, a, a longer lasting uh, campaign for, for change. Um, I just don't see that there's going to be an immediate rea reaction or an immediate capacity to address, um, uh, um, you know, the, the, the situation of the elections particularly. Um, and that's not, you know, again, not not through any fault of, you know, uh, the Palestinians themselves, or not enough, um, not enough, com you know, commitment or, or or engagement on this issue. It's but because structurally there have been impediments to their ability to organize and to create kind of sustained campaigns. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of my two cents on that. Um, I don't I don't see that there's going to be a broad base necessarily. A popular mobilization campaign. Um, there might be some isolated, uh, um, you know, shows of so shows of anger or, or demonstrations and 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 political grievance. But it's going to take more capacity to to uh, build organizations that can challenge the status quo. Thank you, Dana. The next question uh, comes from Khalid Al Gindi, Middle East Institute. Uh, let's address this one to Dr. Hanna Nasser. Uh, with your history of in, the involvement both in the elections, but also in Palestinian politics, uh, going back to the PLO executive committee role uh, that you played at a very crucial historic uh, juncture. Uh, uh, Khalid's question is, if, as we expect, elections for the PA are postponed or canceled, is there any alternative way to revive Palestinian political life? For example, by reforming, restructuring the PLO as the main political address uh, for the Palestinians, or in reforming and restructuring the PLO still considered a uh, pie in the sky? That's a large order. Yeah. And I think really there is no clear path towards the reforms that you have been talking about. And it's unfortunate that we have been in that process. And I think basically the occupation has stifled the spirit of people and have accepted a status quo uh, since uh, probably Oslo. And there is no credible force that is making a possibility for reform and change. Uh, I don't know, I mean, changes sometimes come ab abrupt as we have seen in many countries. But if I want to look at the general mood and the general status in the country, I don't see a credible uh, movement towards reform, reconciliation, democratization, a change in the PNC, reform of the PNC, uh, real elections, real selection, selection based on uh, certain modalities. And I'm afraid that the status quo, as we see now, can continue. The people are, uh, of course, they have been energized a lot in the elections, but if there are, if there is a cancellation of the elections, I'm not sure, but that is something that we have to watch out. I'm not sure that there will be an uproar enough to make the change that you spoke about. Uh, the seriousness of, uh, stopping these elections or cancellation of these elections should be enormous really because the amount of input that has been done by the various parties and lists has been enormous really. 
uh, and yet the test is to see if these elections are canceled for any reason, whether there will be uh, an uproar or not. The problem with this uproar really is there is a rationale which is being now uh, uh, moving around that the Israelis don't accept us to have elections in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem. Of course, that's a very credible reason, but we can overcome that. We can overcome that if there is a political decision to do elections in Jerusalem, irrespective, irrespective of the Israeli acceptance. And it is possible if all the lists, all the parties coalesce in one battle, the battle of Jerusalem. We cannot say that we are under the auspices of democratization, and we have to take the, 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 the cue from Israel to provide us the premises to do our elections in the post offices. I think this is a, 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 a very, a, a very, uh, a very difficult thing to accept that we seek ourselves as Palestinians, we seek the sovereignty or to, uh, 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 to understand the sovereignty of the Palestinians in Jerusalem is through the ballot boxes in the is Israeli post office boxes and under the Israeli auspices uh, without having anybody from the elections commission uh, monitor these uh, post office boxes. Uh. And so really I think uh, uh, the future reform as I see it is not really something that I can bet on very, very soon. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hanna. For those who are interested in this particular point, uh, the last point uh, that Dr. Nasser uh, emphasized, our colleague uh, at the center, uh, Jonathan Kutab, just recently uh, wrote a paper uh, for us on, on the issue of the vote in Jerusalem in terms of logistics, how it could be actually uh, implemented with or without uh, Israeli uh, approval uh, as implied uh, by uh, Dr. Nasser. So I would recommend if you uh, are interested in that to take a look at Jonathan's uh, paper. Uh, in terms of, uh, Dr. Nasser mentioned earlier, Khalil, uh, uh, that if the elections uh, are canceled uh, particularly, uh, it will have uh, tremendous consequences. From your perspective as an expert on Palestinian public opinion, I'm interested particularly on the impact on, on the public, uh, considering the uh, expectation uh, that has become so high lately, as you indicated earlier. Would you like to comment on that, please? Yes, I, in general, I accept what uh, Dana said and what Hannah said about the likelihood that something would or would not happen. I, I, I doubt very much that the mobilization process that took place during the last couple of months have reached a point of no return. I don't think we are there yet. I think this is a very small beginning, uh, but not enough to be able to challenge a decision by a bath to cancel or postpone elections. I, I do see, however, that just like in many other decisions by Abbas that were highly unpopular, this will increase the isolation of the president uh, and his credibility will go down considerably for the public. His legitimacy uh, will go down the drain his ability, therefore, to mobilize the Palestinians in any effective manner, whether to address domestic problems or the issue of Israel and the occupation will diminish considerably. It is already way too, way too, too much diminished. Uh, and as such a decision will uh, essentially kill any chance that this president uh, would be taken seriously by the Palestinian public, even though the public, as I said, is not mobilized enough, is not organized enough to be able to challenge Abbas. Hopefully I'm, I'm wrong about this, but I, 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 I don't see the cancellation decision having the kind of shock impact uh, that would get the Palestinian public from the situation they are currently in. 
And I worry that for Gazans in particular, this will mean a loss. It will mean that Gaza will have to go its way. This will mean the permanent separation between the West Bank and Gaza. And if I move forward to Hamas, uh, this will mean for Hamas, the green light to make its own deal with Israel. Uh, they will lose any confidence in the president and they will not take his word seriously anymore. And their next step, they're stuck with Gaza. They wanted an opportunity to get rid of Gaza or part of Gaza if they could. Uh, but now if, if the president decides to cancel or postpone elections, uh, this will be a sign for Hamas that they need to make their own deal um, and, and the separation between the West Bank and Gaza will be considerably consolidated as a result of the decision. The president will be making a huge mistake. He will be punishing the Palestinian public for a crime that Israel will be committing. Israel commits a crime by preventing Palestinians from holding elections in East Jerusalem and our own president decides to punish the Palestinian people for that decision. It cannot be more crazy than that. Thank you, uh, Khalil. Let me follow up on something you just uh, mentioned uh, in, in this regard, the impact uh, on, the, on the different uh, factions and how that would impact particularly uh, Gaza. But I'd like to address that uh, to, to Dalia because you also mentioned uh, something about the opposition. Uh, to cancellation by the different factions, in, including Hamas. Uh, I was talking earlier this morning uh, to a well-informed uh, Palestinian source uh, in Ramallah, who told me that the announcement will not be made uh, uh, in, uh, on Thursday, unless an agreement has already, which he thinks has already been reached between Fatah and Hamas on the postponement on, on the election. And, and he, uh, essentially uh, referred to an agreement uh, between the two to accept postponement in return for a compromise uh, by Abu Mazen or by Fatah uh, to engage in a government again of national unity uh, involving the two parties, uh, which would be a little bit fine-tuned uh, to make it more palatable for the U.S. by making it uh, national unity of technocrats rather than party apparitioniks. Uh, that will be rejected by uh, the American. What do you think? Um, honestly, <laughs> I think every Is it a far-fetched scenario? <laughs> no, I mean, nothing's really far-fetched. I think it's just funny because every Palestinian I know has some, um, you know, some uh, view or some prediction on, on what's going to happen. Um, uh, I know for a fact that, you know, um, in Cairo, both Fatah and Hamas uh, didn't make any headway in trying to reconcile their main differences. Uh, what they did essentially is try to um, um, uh, agree on how the electoral pie would be uh, uh, divided. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if this is true. I haven't heard anything to that effect. Um, I have what I have been hearing is Hamas is adamant in its, um, uh, you know, is adamant that the elections uh, be allowed to go ahead. And I think, as Dr. Shikaki mentioned, uh, Abbas is essentially um, um, basically punishing Palestinians for for believing that he has been, you know, ruling uh, for far too long. Um, without parliamentary oversight since 2007, uh, 2007 uh, when uh, parliament became defunct. And I, I think um, the reason why this time around things might be a little different, and I, I'm not saying it's, it's going to, you know, lead to a fully fledged intifada. Um, I'm just saying it's a little bit different because there was some hope for uh, parliamentary elections. Um, um, especially with the introduction of um, uh, the uh, runaway lists uh, by Nasser al-Qudwa and uh, Marwan Barghouti. And I, I think a lot of people look at what uh, Abbas has done to Nasser al-Qudwa uh, uh, in, in a manner that, um, that will surely affect Abbas's uh, stature as well, because Abbas made sure to make Al-Qudwa pay for his decision. 
He expelled him illegally from the party's central committee. Um, he took away his position as head of the Yasser Arafat Foundation. He even did um, took away his security detail and government issued car, which shows how far Abbas will go to get back at those who don't obey him. Um, I, I think there was a lot of hope that the Qudwa led slate uh, will solve some of the PA, Fatah, and the PLO's institutional and structural problems. And they're the very same problems that allowed Abbas to be at their helm for so long. I have a journalistic freebie for you. Check on the results of the Hussein al-Sheikh's uh, trip to uh, uh, Qatar and uh, uh, include that in your next article. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, uh, Dalia. Uh, the next question is for uh, Dana uh, from Alison Glick. Uh, uh, Dana, while it seems that the elections would be canceled, regardless of that decisions, how can grassroots organizations tap into the momentum, uh, disappointment, anger generated uh, to focus on the issues you mentioned uh, are paramount? And particularly, how can international solidarity support that? Um, it's a difficult question for me to answer because I'm not on the ground and I'm you know, not an activist. So um, I think that somebody in that position would be better suited to understanding the tactics that work best. Um, however, I can at least say that um, the initiatives that exist or might emerge because of this moment, Again, we keep using Jilid Tajdid as, a, as, a, as an example, but you know that they're not the only ones. Um, they, they should themselves think about um, being as inclusive as possible across uh, geographic boundaries. And I think uh, um, that is you know, at the forefront of a lot of Palestinian activists' mind at this point. Um, in, in addition to, as Dania mentioned, like across the green line, I think that that would be a very interesting dynamic um, uh, to, to kind of push forward in the future um, and try to break the structures that have allowed for the political fragmentation of Palestinians um, the, the last you know uh, 15 years or however long it's been since 2006. <laughs> Sorry, I was fasting and I'm, I'm quite uh, tired at this point. Um, You're all right. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that's one thing. And then um, in terms of the international, you know, um, aspect or international solidarity. I mean, part, like I mentioned earlier, part of the reason why alternatives haven't emerged is because they haven't been allowed to emerge. So I think that if people are interested in what's, you know, in supporting these kinds of initiatives, helping them to build capacity, um, they have to first and foremost, protect them from repression um, and to, you know, advocate on their behalf when they are repressed, either by the, the Israelis or their, you know, subcontractors. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that, that that's a very fulfilling answer to, to the question, but um, that's about as specific as I can get <laughs> given my, my uh, position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hanna, uh, Dana Baranski-Walker uh, basically is asking, uh, you mentioned the uh, percentage, high percentage of registration uh, by the Palestinians, 93.3, I believe you, you mentioned. Uh, how many, uh, what was the percentage among Jerusalem Palestinians in terms of registration? Uh, was there really? a unique problem there? Yes, because of the unique problem in Jerusalem and because we cannot go into Jerusalem and do registration, so we made special uh, measures. We did special measures for Jerusalem and we are allowing them to vote without pre-registration. And the way we do that, we have centers on the suburbs of Jerusalem, over and above the ones in supposedly in the post office boxes in East Jerusalem, we have uh, centers and any Jerusalemite uh, with an ID card, he can come and vote. And the way we check that he did not vote before, I mean, he did not go to several places, we have the stamp on his finger. And so really this is the best we could do for the Jer Jerusalemites is to give them free access to the voting booths without pre-registration. And we do, we do this for about, I mean, the population in Jerusalem that is eligible for voting is about 150,000. And so we have centers all around Jerusalem where they can come and vote and use that 
system. So if, if elections are, of course, uh, canceled, uh, then uh, uh, there's no uh, elections, neither for the Jerusalem rights, nor the people from the West Bank. I'd like to use that time a slot you gave me to say, if the elections are canceled, which is a great, a, 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 a large uh, effect, which will have a large effect, I think Abbas should really do something as large uh, as the cancellation in order for people to be, uh, to uh, accept that cancellation. And I think as powerful as the cancellation. And when you spoke about the uh, unity government, you should realize that the unity government was considered even before elections. I mean, there were lots of people who thought that the best way of going through the process of reconciliation is first to have a unity government, and then the unity government will itself be supervising the elections. Huh? So really, if they want to go back to that order of process, then they will have to have a unity government. I think a unity, a unity government will probably reduce the role that we would see if there is a cancellation or the uproar if there is a cancellation, all right? Is the commission considering uh, new technical kind of methods, uh, if you will, uh, sh should the elections proceed or should they be rescheduled uh, to deal with the, with the issue of Jerusalem access? Well, the, access the question to of there. Jerusalem, I'm sorry, the Jerusalem issue is a matter of sovereignty. And in order to, be, to, to have sovereignty, you have to have uh, voting centers in Jerusalem. Of course, you can do it through emails, through letters, through some other uh, possibility. But the question is not only elections, is not elections per se, is also to indicate that the sovereignty of the Palestinians in Jerusalem is well defined, is well defined. And so really, if you do it by email, then nobody knows that these are people from East Jerusalem. And so we, you cannot, in other words, you cannot resolve a political problem with a technical solution. And we need the votes to be in centers. My take on the centers is that the centers in the post office boxes, in the, in the post offices, not the post office, in the post offices, unfortunately, do not indicate the sovereignty of the Palestinians because in these post offices, it is the Israelis who man the ballot boxes. And none of us as election commission people are allowed to go into the post offices. It's only the Jerusalem rights. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the Israelis bring these post, bring the ballot boxes to Kalandia they hand them over to the Elections Commission, not only the boxes, but with a bill for the extra work that <laughs> they worked uh, during that day for our voting process. So it's really an insult beyond, beyond expectation that we do that in Jerusalem, in the post offices, and we seek for that and we fight that this is our right to do it in the post offices instead of fighting for a more dignified uh, song. Or the cancellation of the elections hinges simply on that very simple fact that we want to have the Israelis accept that Palestinians to go into the post office boxes and put a letter with their vote on that letter. That's the whole problem around which the elections uh, for 200, 2 million and half million people hinges on that simple situation. Instead of making Jerusalem a battle for elections, we are doing it a battle for doing non-elections. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to squeeze a couple more questions. I will combine uh, several. I, I hope that this last question answered uh, Mudar Qassis's uh, technical question about uh, sidelining uh, Jerusalemites. I think Dr. Hanna answered that. 
uh, Khalil, in terms of public opinion, uh, is, is there any uh, indication of where Palestinian public opinion stands on the fairness of selecting candidates? Do the public in Palestine feel that the, the whole range of candidates, the 36 plus list, do, are they representative? Do they satisfy the thirst uh, on the part of Palestinian public for representation? I don't know. We haven't asked. Um, my expectation is that most people don't know yet. Uh, the the <clears throat> The campaigns haven't yet started, and most of these uh, lists are pretty unknown uh, for most Palestinians. They perhaps are known in, in small circles. Uh, so for, for, for most Palestinians, the answer is no, they don't know them. Um, but I think most Palestinians believe that this process is legitimate and should be supported, uh, the, despite all the misgivings that they have about the entire process. Um, most Palestinians tend, however, to put their trust in the existing major political parties because they have been tested, they have proven in the eyes of the public to be representative of their interests. This applies to Farah as well as Hamas and few of the others in, in a much smaller scale. We are essentially a two-party system um, with these two large political, in, in 2006, 85% of the, of the public voted for these two uh, political parties. My expectation is that the same thing will happen in the next elections if it is to take place soon, uh, with, the, with, the, with the only difference being uh, that Fadah vote will be split over the three lists that uh, I mentioned earlier. And, and Hannah mentioned in, in his opening. Okay, let me conclude with again a couple of questions that were uh, addressed to Dahlia. Uh, one uh, with regards to uh, uh, the candidates uh, for elections. Can you shed some light on the requirements? Uh, how did you, in, in covering this issue, did you feel the requirements for candidacy uh, was fair and was uh, improved the selection? Uh, process uh, or not. And Sam Yahuri would like to know what will happen to those, you mentioned those who uh, resigned their jobs to run uh, if the elections are canceled. Uh, what, what will happen to these people in terms of their jobs? Um, so with regards to the changes that Abbas decreed uh, that restrict the possibility of running, um, this includes um, changing the age of the candidacy. I, I believe it was um, Dr. Mustafa al barghouti who said that um, he would like to see it uh, uh, changed to uh, 21 years of age. Uh, there are a lot of high fees involved, uh, and that's my understanding speaking to uh, some of the people who are running in the Nasr al-Qudwa uh, led list. Uh, and also preventing people from wanting to run is anybody who wants to run basically has to resign from his or her job. Um, um, I think uh, at the end of the day, if these people have resigned from their jobs, it just depends what the job is. Uh, if they resign from their PA job, then they're probably most likely going to get their job back if the elections are canceled. And um, I can't imagine um, anybody who's resigned from an NGO job will be permitted to do the same. Uh, people move on, um, uh, uh, jobs are filled. Um, I think it's a real problem for people, especially with um, unemployment, with the high unemployment levels and poverty levels. And I think this is something that per perhaps um, Abbas has not really thought of. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's all about uh, the fact that uh, FETA has been split into three or, or more um, um, uh, lists, and that's uh, that's as far as he that's as far as he sees it, basically. Excellent, thank you uh, very much. Uh, unfortunately, uh, time is of the essence. We went a little bit over time. I apologize. Uh, uh, we do have still about. Uh, we only covered half of the questions we have received. Uh, from the public. So there is a lot of interest. When I said earlier in my introductory remarks, uh, 
uh, that this issue has generated so many questions, you know, since January, uh, most of which uh, have remained unanswered. Uh, I meant it, and this I think is evidence uh, that people still have a lot of questions, but uh, a word of thank you to all of you uh, for your excellent informative uh, presentations. Uh, you've answered a lot of the questions uh, that uh, were not, uh, you know, well answered or well known uh, prior to this event. On behalf of the Institute for Palestine Studies and Arab Center Washington, I would like to thank uh, Khalil, uh, Dalia, Dana, and uh, Dr. Nasser for taking uh, uh, time to, to join us today and help shed some lights uh, on, on these issues. I would like to uh, uh, announce that uh, also uh, th this session, uh, this webinar has a follow-up uh, on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> we are visiting the issue again. Uh, this, uh, the next time we'll be uh, focusing on not the challenges of holding the elections under occupation as much as whether held or canceled, what is the impact on Palestinian politics or the future of the Palestine cause either way. And it will be uh, another set of speakers. Uh, please join us uh, and uh, register for that. The announcement is, is out there on our website and has already been uh, email will be uh, sent, a reminder will be sent actually this afternoon uh, to everybody and we hope to, to see you uh, again uh, on the 5th for part two of this uh, jointly sponsored by the Institute of Palestine for Palestine Studies and Arab Center Washington DC. Thank you for being with us today and uh, please uh, be well and stay safe. Thanks everybody, bye-bye.